And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. Today's guest is Jay Spillers. He is the author of the book, Heaven's Truth, The Parallels Between the Bible and the Near-Death Experience. Besides being an attorney, he has also studied near-death experiences for over 23 years, and he has studied the Bible for over 30 years. So in this podcast, we will learn about how the Bible and NDEs relate to each other. Jay, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. All right, so let's jump right into it. Are there actual near-death experiences recorded in the Bible? Um, Yeah, I think there's at least two actual near-death experiences recorded in the Bible, and there are a number of NDE-like experiences, or what you might call spiritually transformative experiences. There's quite a few of those. Mm -hmm. The two near-death experiences that I'm thinking of, the first one, I think, is the resurrection itself of Jesus, Hmm. which would be a a very incredible um, near-death experience, extraordinary one, to say the least. But I think it is a near-death experience in the sense that Jesus died and he was active and conscious on the other side. And then he came back because he told his disciples that he was going to prepare a place for them, that where he was, they would also be. He told the thief on the cross that today you will be with me in paradise. And then it's also recorded in in, um, 1 Peter that he descended into Hades or to hell and he l- let the spirits who were in prison free and basically took them up. And in Ephesians, it says that he gave gifts to, to men while he was on the other side. So he was actively working and and was conscious on the other side. He went into hell and then he came up and went into paradise. And then he came back the third day. So the resurrection, which is the basis of Christianity, it's the heart of Christianity, is itself arguably a near-death experience. And then there's another one, I believe, is Paul, who um, initially had an NDE-like experience, which we can talk about um, as well. But he actually had a near-death experience when he was, we believe, stoned in Lystra. and It's in Acts chapter 11. And then in um, uh, 2 Corinthians um, uh, 12, verses 2 through 4, it talks about a man who was, um, you know, who was in the body or out of the body. He wasn't sure. He heard inaudible um, sayings and that um, he also, it was not lawful for him to repeat what he saw. And and he went into the third heaven and the paradise. And when it says unlawful, it means that it was, um, there was no way for him to to uh, describe what it was. So it was basically impossible for him to totally describe it because obviously he's, he's talking about his experience there. Mm-hmm. So it was, it, it, the, the meaning is, is impossible. And when it says inutterable sayings, um, I believe that that was probably communicating telepathically. And a lot of times when you see near-death experience, experiences, they say that we didn't communicate with our mouths. It wasn't audible but it was from mind to mind. And that's what it sounds like Paul was experiencing. It was in utterable words Mm -hmm. that were being spoken to him. And so I think that the apostle Paul had a near death experience there. And um, let me stop before that he had had, let me stop you there. Where is that in scripture again? Because I might want to check that out myself. That's very interesting. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse two through four. And it, that's where it talks about he knew a man who died 14 years ago or or a man who was in the body or out of the body. He wasn't sure and that he went to the third heaven to paradise and that he heard inaudible uh, sayings and that it was um, impractical or impossible for him to utter. And there's different translations on that. Some of them say unlawful, mm-hmm. you know, but that was Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2 through 4. Now was that, that, says that was that happening to Paul, or Paul knew a man that that happened to? Well, from what I can see, most scholars believe that this was the Apostle Paul, and he was speaking of himself. He's sort of speaking, you know, third person that I knew a man. But mm-hmm. most scholars believe that that was actually him himself, and they believe that 
this may have happened when he was stoned in Lystra in Acts chapter 14, you know, and he was dragged outside the city and he appeared to be dead or unconscious. And then the apostles came later and he revived and, you know, was okay from that point. Hmm, but they believe, I believe that he had a near death experience at that point. That's an amazing way to look at it. All right, so we know about those two. Are there other similar experiences to NDEs mentioned in Scripture? Um, Yeah, and we can actually talk about one of them was the Apostle Paul himself. This was before he actually had his actual near-death experience. It was on the road to Damascus when he experienced his conversion, where he was met by Christ, who was shining as bright as the noonday sun. And in that experience... um, he was transported, transformed and converted, and he saw a bright light, much like what a near-death experience would see. He was transformed, and he was given a mission to go to the Gentiles and, you know, to share the gospel. And this is very much like an NDE, because a lot of times near-death experiences, they see the bright light, they're transformed, and then they're given some kind of mission. And it may be a very, you know, general mission to love others or to share the experience that they've had or maybe a very specific mission. And then the Apostle Paul had a couple companions with him that were accompanying him, and they partially experienced what he did. They saw a bright light, but they didn't see the image of Christ, and they heard a sound, but they couldn't hear the words. And so they this was like a partially shared experience, and Moody and, and who's done a lot of research in the near-death experience has talked about um, the shared near-death experience in more recent years, where sometimes people will be in the room with someone who's dying Mm -hmm. and they'll partially experience what the person is experiences. So this is kind of similar to that. And then Paul went on to um, basically have a miracle, you know, because he was blinded and then he came back an apostle was sent to him who was Ananias, who laid hands on him and he received his sight. And a lot of times miracles or supernatural events will follow people that have an NDE. And um, Paul used his conversion, this experience, to justify his apostleship, to basically you know, give evidence for his apostleship. And a lot of times when you have a spiritually transformative experience or you have an NDE, it will trigger other NDEs or spiritually transformative experiences. So the experience that Paul had on the road to Damascus may have helped to sort of open the spiritual door for him to later have an actual near-death experience that we just talked about a minute ago. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's that's a pretty common thing. Mm-hmm. Besides the Apostle Paul's experience on the road to Damascus, you have things like the Mount of Transfiguration where uh Peter, James, and John were there, and Christ appeared as a bright, as a bright light. He was shining brighter than, than uh, his clothes were shining bright, brighter than any um, launderer could could get them, is what it says. And Moses and Elijah appeared to him, and a lot of times that's common. We will see religious figures in the near death experience, and you'll see people glowing and things like that. And Peter would go on later to to use the Mount of Transfiguration to help justify his apostleship, you know, to give evidence for him being an apostle. I'm not a biblical scholar, but I'm sure that some of the biblical scholars out there or people who are not scholars but just read the Bible enough may want to contradict you and say, well, that's just Jesus appearing to people, and that's what's so special about Jesus. It's not an NDE, you know, or that's Moses just appearing to people. How would you rebut that? Well, I would say that there are spiritually transformative experiences today where people have seen Jesus or religious figures, and they're, you know, much like an NDE, only the person hasn't died. Right. And um, I would say that um, the experience that the Apostle Paul had when he went to the third heaven was an actual NDE, and it and it can be connected back to his stoning in Lystra. Mm -hmm. And I have seen other scholars that will say that they believe it may have been a near-death experience. I haven't seen too many where they tend to deny it. They maybe Mm -hmm. just don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think that 
it would appear to be a near-death experience, mm -hmm. you know, based on the information that we have in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And it's it's interesting that the two near-death experiences, one was Christ, the resurrection, which is central to Christianity, and the other one was the Apostle Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament. He basically mm -hmm. wrote about 13 or 14 books in the New Testament, so he's pretty central to Christianity as well. And if you have near-death experiences in the Bible, and the Bible c can be um, supported as a spiritual, as a spiritually, a spiritual book that's you know essentially divinely inspired, it would seem to indirectly give evidence for the near-death experiences if NDEs are in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And we can also talk about people who have had NDEs that were told uh, things about the Bible as well. I think this is amazing that the way you're presenting this, and I've never heard of this before. Are you the only person that you know of, or has anybody else ever looked at the Bible in this way and thinking about these scriptures as NDEs? Well, I've heard other things before, and there actually is a book that I drew some inspiration from. It's called Imagine Heaven, and it's by John Burke, mm -hmm. and he basically use the NDE to sort of give hope to people about heaven. And he would sort of tie it back mm -hmm. to, you know, Christianity and the Bible. But I don't think he did as direct of a side-by-side -side comparison mm -hmm. of the Bible and the near-death experiences, what I was trying to do with my book, right. you know. But I think that he had mentioned those. The, he had mentioned the resurrection. And there's actually a... a uh, a apologist, the one, an apologist is someone who defends the faith, who um, his name is Dr. Habermas, and he basically gives a lot of evidence for the resurrection, and that's kind of his specialty is, you know, using the resurrection to prove Christianity. And very recently, the past few years, he's also moved into studying the near-death experience and sort of using that as an apologetic or defense for the faith as well and for God. Mm -hmm. And he, I've heard him make a connection between the resurrection and the near-death experience as well. So mm -hmm. there are others that are coming around to the idea mm -hmm. of, you know, the near-death experience and the Bible being connected. I think it's amazing. Are there scriptures in the Bible that describe heaven the same way people describe heaven who have had an NDE? Well, yeah, I think when you when you see things in the Bible that will talk about, um, you know, the gates of heaven and people think of the pearly gates, that there are, you know, gates in heaven. And there's been near-death experiences um, where people have seen gates. And actually, Danny and Brinkley talked about seeing pearly gates. And uh, there's been uh, people that have said they've seen the throne of God or that they knew the throne of God was just on the other side. And they've seen temples in heaven. And one thing, too, is they've seen cities in heaven, like uh, Mount Thomas Benedict in his NDE was given a tour and could see many cities in heaven and many different countries and things like that. And one of the things that's talked about in Scripture is heaven is pictured as the heavenly city, which is the New Jerusalem, which I talk about in my book. And I say that I believe the New Jerusalem is a realm within heaven, but it's not necessarily the entirety of heaven. So you do see a city mentioned in scripture, and then you see people that have had NDEs that have seen cities. And uh, one thing it talks about in the Bible is like um, the river of life and the tree of life. And people have seen rivers and they've seen what they've described as the tree of life in heaven. So there is sort of a parallel between nature scenes and specific things like the tree of life and the river of life and things like that. And one thing that a lot of people talk about in heaven is seeing libraries in heaven. And I know one thing is that it doesn't directly say that there's libraries in heaven, but it talks about books being opened in Revelation and people's works being judged and, and things like that. So it would seem to imply if there's books in heaven, that there may be libraries in heaven like the NDE talks about. So mm -hmm. there is kind of a lot of paralleling imagery that is mentioned both in the NDE and, and in the Bible itself. Do you think it's possible when they think of a library in heaven, in the Bible, they're really trying to describe a life review, kind of like a library of the mind? 
or the spirit. Yeah, yeah, and I and I get into that too because um, you know, a lot of times when when they talk about the life review, a lot of people in the modern context will talk about it looked like a giant screen that appeared and that I was able to see everything in my whole life. And I thought, well, this is very similar to when we at the judgment in, in heaven and the books are open, you know, because obviously I talk about my Bible. I, I talk about my book that, you know, when the Bible was written, they didn't have movies and things like that. So the imagery that people would have seen and what would have been relatable to the people would be more like a book than, yeah. you know, a, a movie screen. But I mean, I, I have seen some NDEs too, where they talk about, it was like a, a book opened and then a screen appeared and they saw things. So sometimes there's kind of both imagery. And I think um, a lot of times you experience things in the heaven with the NDE and with the Bible in a relatable way that it appears to you in a way that you can understand. And I mean, a lot of times with heaven too, when people go and have a heavenly experience, a lot of times they'll say, I was there and I experienced something that I think was just for me, you know, and that this imagery that I saw was something that was meaningful to me. So in a sense, we sort of create our own heaven and heaven it appears in a way that makes sense to us. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I do kind of think that it is sort of in our spirit that we perceive it certain ways and it's put in a what appears to be a literal form that can make sense to us and it can take different forms for different people. Right. Some people in their NDE either go to hell or someplace that's very unpleasant. Do you see that? Well, um, I mean, in terms of hell, the people have talked about, um, you know, when the rich man and Lazarus died and, you know, there's sort of a picture of the, rich man in hell and Lazarus in heaven. And that may be more of a allegorical picture, you know, about something else. But some people do take that to be like a literal hell and someone is there, you know. And I think one thing that the Bible or that the NDE talks about is what they talk about the void, which is like a dark space. And that a lot of times it can be very dark and seem very gloomy and it can be a very unpleasant experience. And the Bible mm -hmm. talks about outer darkness and, um, you know, going, being sent to outer darkness. And I think that outer darkness and the Bible and the void are basically the same thing. It's a place of darkness. And one thing I do understand is um, um, Angie Finnamore had actually committed suicide and, you know, she had her life review, and then she descended into this dark place. And she's one of the few that I've ever seen where they had their life review, and then they went into what appeared to be hell. Hmm. And then Christ and God appeared to her and said, is this what you want? And she said no, and she was able to be taken out of that place, you know, because usually they they go to hell or the dark place, and then they call out to God and and then are taken up and have a life review in heaven. But this was the opposite. And she said that she was basically informed when she was on the other side that for most people, hell functions more like a purgatory in the sense that, you know, it's there to point you to God, to give you an opportunity to come to God rather than being a place that's endless in duration, you know. Mm -hmm. And I do get into certain things in scripture about um, you know, uh, I think there's a universal aspect to salvation. I don't necessarily argue universalism in an absolute sense, because I do believe there's free will, and it talks about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, but that seems to be more of an exceptional thing, that people can reject the light and go into darkness and stay there. You can be there as long as you want, you know, but I think that for most people, hell functions more in a remedial sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've, I kind of came to that, you know, 20 years ago, and I've sort of modified a little bit here and there, but that's kind of how I see it from the ND in the Bible. And I do give scriptures that talk about things like the restitution of all things. And I get into like the words for hell when it talks about 
um, go into eternal punishment. The word eternal there, the root word is aeon, and then it's aeonios. And the word aeon means age. It's where we get our, our word eon from. So a person could be eons in the darkness, but not necessarily in the darkness without end, without ever having any hope. Right. You know, but that's how I saw, you know. I think it's quite often that people who have NDEs see angels. Are you finding any correlation with angels and near-death experiences in the Bible? Well, people have seen angels, and a lot of times, um, I think it was Howard Storm saw Jesus, and he was actually saw angels as well. So that, you know, I do believe that, yeah, the near-death experience supports the idea that there are angels in addition to things like Christ and God and that, you know, angels are there to help us, you know. And um, I mean, at Mel and Thomas Benedict talked about angels, basically, at least some of them may be created by us for us, you know, specifically, that we may have our own specific angels that are there for us, you know, kind of like guardian angels in that sense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I see angels in both the Bible and the near-death experience working to help human beings. But do you see something in the Bible that's, you know, showing someone having an NDE or NDE-like experience or an out-of-body experience and interacting with angels? Well, I don't think it referenced angels in there. Mm -hmm. You know, he may very well have experienced angels, but I don't think it uh, specifically mentioned them. I know that um, and I didn't get into this really in my book, is that um, there are angels that have visited people, like, you know, Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel, and that Peter was visited by angels and had interactions, you know, in the book of Acts, you know. So angels do interact with people and in the Bible, and we see that in the Indies too. Mm-hmm. You know, people said that they had their own specific angels that, spoke with them you know but i didn't really get into whether they had they saw an angel specifically in the nde so you've been studying the bible for 30 years did you go like page by page through the bible combing through it to see if you found scripture that appeared to be nde like when you were writing this book well i mean i i obviously knew of a lot of scriptures. I think it was something, do you want me to just sort of um, tell the story of how I got interested in um, the near-death experience and things like that? Sure. Because what basically had happened was I I came to Christ when I was nine years old. I received Christ into my heart, and that was in 81. And then about two years later, I was watching a show on TV called That's Incredible, Mm -hmm. And they were doing a story on near-death experiences. This was back in 1983. Mm -hmm. And I was just sort of blown away by it. I was mesmerized by it that, okay, well, I believe in heaven by faith and that, you know, Christ is there. He's the son of God by faith. But these people had actually died and went to heaven. Uh, Some of them have actually said that they talked to Jesus and, you know, were told that he was the son of God and had all these, you know, confirming experiences that were you know, very vivid and everything. And I was just sort of blown away by it. And I thought, well, maybe what I'll do is I'll call this popular Christian radio program at the time that deals with apologetics and things like that. It was called The Bible Answer Man by Walter Martin. So, you know, I called him and I had a little tape recorder up against the speaker recording it to see what he was going to say. And that, And he was basically very dismissive at that time you know, and basically made me feel like, you know, it's a stupid question, you know, why are you talking about this stuff? And mm-hmm. this was in 83, and I think a lot of Christians were a lot less open to it, you know. So I just, I felt kind of disillusioned, so I put it aside for a while. And then when I got into law school, probably around 97, I started getting interested in, again because I was having doubts in my faith and questioning things and, you know, things like hell and well, how does this relate? And, you know, so I started studying the near-death experience again. And as I would look at the near-death experiences, I would see a lot of parallels between that and the Bible because they'd say, oh, I saw this in heaven and I was told this and I saw Jesus and he was doing this. And I'm like, 
yeah, because I think of all these scriptures that, oh, that sounds like this. And right here in scripture, you know, that sounds like that. You know, so I was able to pretty much instantly see the connections between the two, you know. And that's how I sort of started to draw parallels. And I've been studying it for, um, you know, over 20 years. And I, I got the idea that I really wanted to write a book about it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just sort of directly paralleling because I hadn't re- seen a book or anything that was drawn, you know, direct parallels side by side of the two events. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how I got into that. That's interesting. Are there any messages that are central to both the near death experience and the Bible? Yeah, I think um, one experience that, or one teaching that's central that if you start talking to near death experiencers, uh, um, they'll say the importance of love and that they were, they were presented with unconditional love from God. They felt it. They just knew it. And, you know, like uh, one near-death experience was Sharon Milliman, and she talked about how she felt this unconditional love and that she knew God loved everybody and that God was, uh, that love was everything that was central to what it was about. And, you know, you see that so much in Scripture because, like, in the New Testament, you know, Jesus said all the law and the prophets basically hang on two commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the Apostle Paul in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 had said, you know, if you have everything, but you don't have love, you don't really have anything. You know, you can do all these great works and you can, you know, be a martyr and all this. But if you don't have love, you've missed the boat, basically, is what he's saying. And so that, and and that was basically the test to be a disciple for Christ. He said, "You know, they'll know you are my disciples by your love." And Jesus, you know, basically went further than even the Old Testament. He said, "Love your enemies." So love is so central to Christianity in the New Testament, and then it's so central to the near death experience. You know that that's pretty easy to parallel between the two. And I like the fact that. Um, in Sharon's t- NDE, she said, it's the small things that can mean so much, you know, just like doing a small thing. Mm-hmm. And when, when I heard her testimony on, from her near-death experience, one of the things I thought of when Jesus, when Jesus said, um, if you give a cup of cold water in my name, you will be rewarded. So the small things are what matter the most in many cases, because a lot of us aren't going to do, you know, really grand things. We're not, you know, we're not going to be Martin, you know, Martin Luther King, or we're not going to be Mother Teresa or something like that. But where we are, we can do small things to show love. And I see that both in the NDE and the Bible, you know. Mm-hmm. So the centrality of love isn't very important. Can you read us some direct scripture and then we can kind of think about it and see, you know, see what it's like? Well, do you want me to read that uh, scripture from the Apostle Paul's near-death experience? Yeah, I think it's only like three or four sentences, right? Yeah, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and it's verses 2 through 4, um, chapter 12, starting at verse 2, it says, I knew a man in Christ above, above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven, and I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. And that was basically the entity that I was talking about. Right. You know. Yeah, that's very interesting. Even if you didn't think about it in NDE terms, it's kind of hard to understand because I knew this guy in the body, out of the body, God knows. So give me your take on that again. Well, basically I broke it down in my book, you know, and I talked about, you know, he says whether in the body or out of the body, mm-hmm. I think Paul is basically t- describing it from what he was thinking at this time, you know, that um, it was just so foreign to me what was going on. I I knew I was in the third heaven, 
and it felt like I had a body, but maybe not. And um, I think a lot of times people in their NDEs will say that, you know, I felt like I had some kind of spirit body, but it was clearly different than what I had on earth. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of interesting because Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 goes into this big, long discussion about, you know, when we when we die, we will be given a spiritual body, which is incorruptible and, you know, won't be destroyed. And I think that, you know, a lot of what Paul said later after his initial experiences, basically um, he he thought about it and he thought about the spiritual body and he was talking about it in 1 Corinthians 15. And it's interesting to note that the Apostle Paul um, didn't seem to fear death at all, that he seemed to be less fearful than anyone else that wrote scripture. Mm -hmm. Cause he says in Philippians one, I think it's, I think it's Philippians one six. He said to live is Christ and to die is gain. So he thought that death was better than this life. And mm -hmm. that's such a common thing that you hear from, from near death experiencers is that it was way better over there than what's here, you know, I think probably, you know, all the apostles will believe, well, sure, heaven is better, mm -hmm. but they hadn't seen it necessarily like Paul, the apostle Paul had, where he was actually there. And it's like, yeah, we know it's better, but I know it's better, you know. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like um, someone that knows of Hawaii and it's beautiful versus someone that's been there and has seen it. Mm -hmm. You know, he has a perspective that the other writers of Scripture I don't think really had. You know, and mm -hmm. and when, when it talks about the unspeakable words or unutterable, depending on the translation, I think that that was basically the mind to mind telepathic communications that they weren't using words to speak, you know. And I think when it talks about Christ, when or when Paul went to paradise, you know, I, I talk, talk about this in my book is that paradise, the word means garden, mm -hmm. and a lot of times paradise is kind of seen as sort of the entryway into heaven, you know, that a lot of times people have near death experiences and they'll say, I didn't go fully into heaven, but I was taken to like this garden. And I, you know, it was like a little entryway that I was able to have interactions with God or Christ or angels or loved ones. But it was just sort of like I was at the corridor, but I couldn't go all the way in. And I think maybe Paul's near death experience was, he was at the corridor. He was at the entryway, but he he knew he wasn't going to be able to go fully over. Mm -hmm. And that's probably because we know that he had a he had a mission to fulfill, and you know, being an apostle and you know, um, sharing the message with the Gentiles. So mm -hmm. I think that you know his experience was maybe kind of limited in that sense. What is the word that they use in the Bible for gate? Because it's interesting. I started thinking about it as we were talking, that they say, you know, heaven's gates open up. And I, the original Bible, I believe, was written in Greek. And so I wonder if mm -hmm. even there's a misunderstanding for the word gate. I mean, that, that may very well be true, because I know in Revelations, I believe that it had said that, you know, the gate was open. You know, that's basically, there's sort of the entryway, you know, and I like I said, it talks about a gate, and some people have seen a literal gate, but sometimes, but Christ has also talked about being the gate into heaven. I'm the gate to the sheepfold. So there's different images. There's there's a literal gate that sometimes people may see or experience, but then there's sort of um, more allegorical understandings, like Christ is the gate, or you know, there's an entryway into heaven that you sort of go through to get all the way into heaven. You know, I was thinking that, you know, the way you use the word pearly gates, you know, obviously that's white and people may go through a white tunnel or white light. So I'm wondering if even that they can't correctly describe it. So they kind of say pearly gate, you know what I mean? Like a white gate. And if that's anything similar to an NDE. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I think like, you know, there's different ways of describing the brightness because like um, I was talking about Moses and the burning bush, you know, that he saw that God is a burning bush, you know, yet it didn't consume the bush. And it's like, 
was it a, a literal fire that was burning a bush or was it just like a bright shining light that he had no way of describing other than to say it kind of looks like a fire to me you know mm -hmm. so that there may be different ways of trying to understand what that bright light is and you know i think a lot of times pearls represent something of value so maybe when they saw the pearly gates it would say to a person there's something of value um through these gates you know mm -hmm. and you know so people can experience it both literally and allegorically and i talk about things like that in the bible i mean in my book is there any more evidence in the bible that you can show us that would show an nde um well i think the only NDEs that i'm aware of that are direct were the apostle paul and the resurrection but I talk about, uh, I, we talked about the Mount of Transfiguration, Paul's conversion, and Moses. And then Moses actually saw the face of God after the burning bush in a later thing where he, he described seeing, you know, the brightness and that basically his face radiated afterwards. So that Moses actually had two experiences that were NDE-like. And there's an, ex there's an experience that um, Steph Stephen had you know, who was, who was stoned, um, you know, basically this was before Paul was converted. Um, he was stoned to death by the religious leaders and Paul was giving approval to it. But he basically, before they stoned him, he looked up into heaven and he saw um, Jesus and God, you know, sitting in heaven. Jesus was at the right hand of the Father and it basically gave him hope. And his experience is... Um, uh, what a lot of people would call like a deathbed experience because he hadn't died yet, but he was about to die. And a lot of times deathbed visions, you know, it can happen if you're just about to die, you'll get a glimpse of heaven or a glimpse of Christ or a loved one will come see you. So you have kind of a deathbed um, vision of heaven with uh, Stephen. And I, I, a lot of times um, I talked about, uh, in the book of Revelation, where uh, the apostle John was able to see to see into heaven and to saw to see Christ glowing like a you know like a white light and saw certain things, and that was very similar to Ian McCormick's near death experience, where he also went from being an atheist to being a Christian and into evangelist. But he said that he saw you know like a golden sandals and he saw the brightness of a man it was sort of like a silhouette but he didn't see the face and he didn't know it was christ until he got back but he goes on to describe what he saw you know christ looking like and then he went back and looked at the book of revelation and it was like oh this is like what the apostle john saw you know much, mm. it was very similar to what the apostle john saw so there's a lot of different imagery in the bible that connects to what you see in the near-death experience now, when you talk about this stuff with your family and friends or associates or colleagues, how do they accept it? Do they think you're crazy or do they think you make a lot of sense? Well, I think a lot of people today are more open to it. And there's been a lot of movies like uh, Heaven is for Real with Colton Burpo and different um, Christians that died and had heavenly experiences so there's a lot more openness to it, you know. I think a lot of times at worst you might get, you know, sort of a cautiousness to it. Like, I don't know, it might be true, it might not, you know, might be connected. There there are still a few Christians out there that are, you know, very close to it. And there's some uh, national, there's one national pastor I know of that is extremely negative towards it and, was negative of Colton Burpo's experience. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think for the most part, uh, Christianity has become much more open to it. And like I said, there's apologists that have, have either opened up to it, like Dr. Habermas or other ones that are maybe at least sympathetic. Like they say, well, maybe this is a, a vision or a dream and it's something that could be spiritually relevant. You know, so there, there's at least more of an openness to it you know, in the Christian world. And I, and I think that's pretty much what I see. When did you publish your book? I published an ebook version of it in March. And then it was July. I published a paperback 
which is available on Amazon. Right. And I've been trying to get into bookstores, you know, mm-hmm. and things like that as well. Mm-hmm. Is that the only place that we can get your book is on Amazon right now? Well, in terms of wide distribution, it's the only place that you can get it. I've been able to get it in a few independent bookstores, you know, in this this state in Idaho and mm-hmm. things like that. But it's the only place that you could probably find it widely, mm-hmm. you know, at mm-hmm. this point. I'm trying to get in more bookstores, things like that. Are you already working on a second book? Well, yeah, right now I'm working on a second book and I'm it's on a kind of somewhat different thing, but mm-hmm. I'm working on a book on meditation and you know, how um, meditation can be available for everyone. And I get into different, um, you know, techniques and explaining things and the practice. And it's more from my personal experience that I draw a lot of it, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's a book on meditation. Mm -hmm. I do want to write some other books on near-death experiences. I'm hoping to maybe gather um, people who have had direct encounters with Christ and a near death experience that haven't already been published that and put it together, mm-hmm. you know? So I'm hoping to write that. If people want to contact you, are you open to the public or are you a private person? I have uh, basically, I have a Facebook page, which is spiritual discussion with author Jay Spillers. Mm-hmm. And I also have a Facebook group called the Bible and the near death experience that people can join as well. So I have a a group and a Facebook page. They're both on Facebook. Mm -hmm. That that's probably the main way they could get in contact with me and, you know, dialogue with me. Well, I want to let everybody know that the name of Jay's book again is heaven's truth. The parallels between the Bible and the near death experience. All right, Jay, before we wrap it up here, do you have one last message that you can leave with the audience? Yeah, I just think uh, when you when you start to look at the Bible um, in terms of virtually everything you can think of, you know, because I got into it like salvation, judgment. There is a connection with the near death experience, and that um, you know, like I, I talked about uh, the life review, and I got into pretty significant detail about you know how that connects. That in the Bible it says we will all give an accounting. And when you see the life review, um, basically uh, your life just unfolds and you experience everything that you did in your life as other people experienced it. So it's like there's a vivid creation in the near-death experience of what you read in the Bible. And I think that's probably the connection that I, I see so strongly is that the near-death experience brings together the Bible in a vivid uh, way for our modern context that that we could probably relate to in our culture. So I, you know, I think that's kind of, I don't see the Bible and the near death experiences competing with each other. I see the the two as complementing each other and that the near death experience gives a modern vivid illustration for us of what we read in the Bible. I, I guess I would just leave it at that. Do you think that there's a version of the Bible that makes it easier to correlate near-death experiences with? Well, in my book, I, I was I was reading from the King James just because it was handy. Mm-hmm. But in my book, I used the New King James. Um, I just personally like that version because it retains a lot of the richness and beauty of the King James. It just sort of updates the language. In terms of one book or one translation being more supportive of the ND. I don't know that that's necessarily true. A lot of times it gets into, you know, getting back to the original Greek and things like Strong's Concordance and looking up words and things like that to kind of see, you know, how it parallels too. you know, and you can find a lot of tools like uh, online, you know, like Blue Letter Bible and things like that, you know, but I, I don't know that any particular translation is better than another, you know. But there are a lot of good modern translations, you know, like the New Living Translation is pretty good, and the NIV is pretty good. I don't think the New King James is too bad either. All right, Jay, well, I'm going to wrap it up. I really appreciate you giving me some time today. I wish you massive success with your book. When you write another one or if you write a follow-up to it, 
if you do more research, then I'd love to have you back and talk more about if you have any new findings. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. I'd love to come back. All right. Thanks for joining me tonight, Jay. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.